The following presentation is brought to you live from Dallas, Texas, for the 26th Annual International Association of Square Dance Callers Annual Convention. This is Tape 8, Hook'em, Teaching Dancing. Okay, please find yourself a chair, and we've got uh, three panelists, so we've got uh, quite a inf little information that we'd like to uh, be able to share with you, and we want to have time at the end for questions also. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say good afternoon. I'm your moderator, Jerry Junk, and we're really glad that you came to this session. It's called How to Hook 'em. Teaching is Dancing. Uh, our session deals with hooking the new dancers on the activity. Hooking them means retaining them. Retaining dancers is and should be one of our most important responsibilities as a caller and a teacher. Uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce the members of our panel. First, on my far right is Lanny Weekland. He's from Omaha, Nebraska. Lanny has been calling since 1985, and he calls for four clubs in the Omaha and Lincoln, Nebraska area. He also regularly travels out of his home area as a guest caller. He teaches annually for all of his clubs and is currently working the much-talked-about 10 and 10 program with another caller, Mike Hogan, in Omaha. Second to my immediate right is Jerry Story from Mission, Texas. He's a full-time caller and co-owner of Royal Records. He's known around the world for his calling skills. He also works a winter program in South Texas, where he and a number of other callers have a unique set of circumstances for teaching new dancers. Finally, to my left is Daryl Clendenin. He's from Portland, Oregon and Apache Junction, Arizona. Darrell also is a full-time caller and owner-producer of Chinook Records. He spent many years as club caller and teacher for several clubs in the Portland, Oregon area, in addition to traveling extensively. He now spends his winters in Apache Junction and works a winter program there, and I'm sure he's going to talk about the use of a Sicilian circle as a teaching tool. You're not. But it's, but it's on this right. Okay, it's on the right up. Now... I'm sure. The charge, the charge for this session, and this is such an important session, I hope you realize how important this session is. After you've taught the definition, explained its application, allowed the new dancers to practice the moves, have they learned? Maybe it takes more than that. Maybe it's not enough to just get through the action. They have to dance it. This session will stress the importance of converting the calls from actions they can execute into the experience of dancing. The panel will discuss both the mechanical teaching process and the need to instill the attitude necessary to interest new dancers in committing to the lessons necessary to becoming square dancers. As stated, our session deals with hooking the new dancers on the activity. Hooking them does mean retaining them. By the start of lessons, we are assuming the following, that the club has done a good job of recruiting. Our part as teacher is and should be much more than the physical teaching of these calls. We must be proficient at the mechanical process necessary to teach calls, but we also have a responsibility to make these new dancers feel welcome to the activity because that's what's going to keep them. It has to do with our attitudes toward them and is teaching lessons merely a job we have to do for the club or do we have a real sense of passion for the activity that we desire to pass on to them? Not only do we want to prepare them for this current set of lessons that they're now taking, but how can we still instill in them the desire to find a future in the square dance world? Our panel consists of three callers having to deal with a wide variety of situations and circumstances. Because of its diversity, I think this is going to be a most interesting session regarding each panelist's approach to new dancers. Now, all of us know that many clubs offer the first three nights of lessons free. Therefore, we take the attitude that we have this window of time, three lessons, to hook the new dancers on the activity. With that thought in mind, each of our panelists will address one night 
of those first three nights of lessons. Daryl's going to take the first night, Jerry Story will take the second night, and Lanny the third. The thought is that if we haven't instilled that attitude necessary to interest these new dancers in the activity by the third lesson, we're not going to get them hooked. Okay, so with that preface, I'm going to turn this over to these guys. When they have finished their presentations, we'll open the floor to questions, and we do have a floor microphone here. The session is being taped, and we want everybody to ask their questions on the microphone so that we don't have any dead air on the tape. And with that, uh, make welcome Daryl Clendenin. Oh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, you already said everything that I was going to say. No. Thank you for coming. Uh, not only will there be time for questions, but there will be time for suggestions from the floor as well. We'd like you to be 100% involved in what's going on here. If you have some really great ideas, we'd like to have you share those with us as well, because I need all the help I can get. Hooking them means retaining them, as Jerry said. Retaining them during the class, the first night, the first night. What is it that we hope to accomplish in those first three lessons? Suffice to say that the objective is to sell the activity to the new people. Far too often we enter into the classes with the idea that we're there to teach folks how to dance. Wrong. If we were to change our attitude to one that has us trying to sell the fun, recreational, and social aspects of the activity, we might find better success at hooking them into it. Many times it's left up to the club members to try and make the new dancers enjoy themselves while the instructor goes about the business of teaching. It would make a lot more sense to have the person that's holding the microphone recognize the responsibility of making the class time fun. That's what they're there for. Generally, the clubs give the first three lessons free. This serves two purposes. Number one, it allows for a repetition of material for at least the first few lessons. This way they can admit additional people into the class. And number two, hopefully it gives a tremendous amount of confidence to those that have been there for all three of the introductory sessions, repetition being the best teacher. Hopefully by the end of those first three lessons, you have the new people hooked. I've gone, I go on to uh, list some of the things that I do or that I feel are responsible, uh, your responsibilities to make it easier. You are the host. It's not wise to depend solely on the club to make the new people feel welcome. You should get to the hall early enough to set up your sound, have everything ready to go, and greet the people as they come through the door. Shake everybody's hand. Make a point of trying to remember their names. I, that's one thing that a lot of people say, oh, I have a terrible time remembering names. Everybody does. But if you're there, if you uh, learn their name right up front, if you use it twice as you're greeting them at that door, it's going to make it a whole lot easier. The quicker you, you can remember their first names and call them by their names, the quicker they're going to feel like they're a part of what you are. Keep in mind, they have a right to be nervous. You don't. You need to do your best to make them feel comfortable. The faster they feel at ease, the sooner they'll begin to enjoy everything that's going on. Remember, you're dealing with people that probably aren't in the habit of interacting with other complete strangers. They might require actual introductions in order to be able to visit with another couple. This, as a host, is your responsibility. Take John and Mary over to actually meet Bud and Lou and introduce them. If you can find out anything about these couples as you do that, tell the other couple about them. Say, John here, he's a truck driver, ah, da, 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 and Bud here, he's a farmer. Tell them something about each other. Give them a chance to start interacting. It's, it's always amazing how little actual interaction many, many, many people have out there. They interact with their wife, maybe uh, other parts of their family, and they just say hi or howdy to somebody at church, and that's about the end of it. The rest of it is maybe somebody at work. But as a couple activity, take them over. Actually introduce them. 
I've talked many times with couples that don't dance very much anymore or who have dropped out totally because the gang that they used to run with are all gone. Chances are the gang was made up with folks that they met in beginner classes. It's always easier to bond with people that are in the same boat. These people are all nervous. They're looking for a friend at that point. Uh, you can get these people to start developing this circle of friends that you're going, they're going to be running with for many, many years, but it's going to require your help. I said, be at the door, be at the door and shake hands with everybody as they come into the hall. I think that's probably one of the most important things that you can do. I firmly believe in physical contact. And I'm not saying get up there and hug and kiss and uh, do the things that you would do with somebody that's been in the activity and have already, uh, you know, become relaxed with that sort of thing. But touch. Uh, one of the reasons I say that is I remember a television show that I saw many, many years ago now. Uh, it was on public access television or uh, whatever their, what is it, public television, PBS. Uh, one of the universities was running a study on uh, how people reacted to each other. And what they did, they had a hidden camera focused on a telephone booth. And they left change in the coin slot in the, this payphone booth. And what, what does everybody do when they hang up? They check the slot for coins, right? Well, they would wait till somebody went in, make a call, they check the slot for coins, and then they would come out and they would say, excuse me, I think I left my change in there. Did you find it? And almost without exception, the people would say no and turn around and walk away. But if they said, excuse me, and just touched them that much and said, I think I left my change in there. Did you find it? Out it came and went into their hand. And they did this over and over and over again, many times. And that much casual contact made that much difference in the way that those people reacted to each other. Uh, why? I don't know. But if you're standing there at the door and you touch those people every time that they come through that door, it's going to make them feel differently about you. If you take them over and introduce them to another couple and they shake hands, it's going to make them feel differently about each other. That's one of the nicest things about square dancing is the fact that it's a group of people working with each other and they're touching many, many different people. That's why that they can become such close friends. Give them a chance to bond. Help them as much as you can. Uh, computer mixing cards. We use those for every class uh, down in the valley. I, do you use them in your classes, workshops? Uh, the, uh, you might not know where they, what they are, but I think you probably do. If you don't, we can uh, give you more information on them. But they automatically mix the folks, get them touching different people for every tip, uh, levels out the floor, discourages actual clicks within the group. Uh, if you have problem couples that happen to be in the same square, you can still move them around to kind of fix that to where that's not a major problem. Uh, but we believe in those classes that you should be using some automa automatic way of mixing the couples up out there. Uh, preparation. How much do you teach in those first three lessons? Uh, answer. As much as it takes to entertain new people. Don't you agree that the first three lessons are the most important in terms of keeping new people in the class? If you do agree, then I would suggest that you spend a lot more time preparing for the first three lessons than you do for any of the rest of the class sessions. It's very important that everyone has the ultimate faith in your abilities as a teacher. Being well prepared will only help that perception. First impressions are the most important. Be ready when you go to that class. Don't get there and wonder what you're going to do. Be prepared. Be prepared mentally. Go into the session with the confidence that you know your job. Know ahead of time how you're going to start. Convey to the new dancers the feeling that this guy knows what he's doing up there. 
patience. Every caller has patience, right? That's our strongest virtue, patience. Callers need to develop an attitude that, that allows the dancers to learn at their own pace. Allow them to learn at their own pace. It's too easy to rush the dancers through material just to get them to the point that they can dance to us or with the club. Learn to call and entertain at their level. Should never be any hurry. Relax. Let them have fun along the way. Encourage the club to have fun with the new people at class level. Impress on them the importance of making the new dancers proud of what they're doing without, them tell them, without telling them what they're missing by not being at the club level. Does that make sense? This is fun, but boy, just wait till you get on to this good stuff that's later on. They don't need it. Every class should be a dance in itself. Let them enjoy a good dance experience, a good dance program within every class session. Learning should be fun. It should be some of the most fun that they'll ever have in the activity. If it turns into work, they're gone. If it turns into work or any kind of stress, they're gone. Frustration. Remember that the new people don't share your confidence. They have to be shown that not only are you a good teacher, but they can be and are good dancers all the way through. Has to be done in a way that allows them to overcome their feelings of inefficiency. And they all have that. Must do them without them realizing that it's actually happening. Frustration is our biggest enemy. Most first-timers don't really think they can keep up. Don't do anything that will convince them that they were right. Make sure that your approach to dancing is comfortable and geared to folks that don't speak or understand the square dance language. And that's not just dancer frustration either. It's caller frustration. We've all been up there on the microphone trying to teach the new dancers how to dance, and there's that one couple out there that no matter how many times you tell them and no matter what approach you take to teaching square through, that gal has her hand back there for the courtesy turn at the end of it, and the guy is all too happy to take her in a courtesy turner, right? Uh, if it isn't that movement, it's going to be something else. And you can tell them over and over and over and over again, and they'll still do it. And it's awfully easy as a caller to get frustrated and say, well, why can't I get this message across to those people? Well, if the caller gets frustrated, it doesn't come across as a caller being frustrated with his own inabilities. It comes across as, uh, I'll never be able to satisfy that guy, and they're gone. Deal with frustration by stopping. Find a reason to stop. Get away from it. Go back. Try a new approach to presenting the material. Praise is one of the most important tools you can use in teaching. Just think of how much you enjoy it when somebody tells you how well you call. The facts might really be the opposite, but you'll work even harder if you think that everyone is appreciating what you're doing. The same holds true for the dancers, especially the new dancers. As they show even the smallest amount of progress, don't forget to give them their pats on the back. They'll enjoy it as much as you enjoy their applause. Don't forget to entertain them. Remember, this is a recreation. They're not working towards a college degree. Be prepared with a few jokes or at least one-liners that can get them giggling and feeling at ease. The very core of what we need to be is entertainer. We have to make it fun. If we don't make it fun, they won't be back. Don't let the job of teacher get in the way of the real job of entertaining. It's very easy to get caught up in the time frame that we think we should take the, uh, teach the new people and uh, start to put pressure on the dancers just to keep up with that timetable. At that point, we aren't selling the activity. We're just doing our job. We need to always be selling that activity, always be entertaining, always be letting them have a fun. There'll be plenty of time later for all those other less entertaining, in entertaining aspects of the activity if you can keep them coming past that first night. And finally, the lesson plan. Don't lock yourself into a lesson plan that won't work. 
be prepared to present as much as necessary, but not any more than everyone can handle comfortably. That means leave yourself plenty of room to exit. If you find that folks have uh, absorbed all they can for one session, back away from them. Just let them relax and have some fun dancing as far as you've got. If you don't get clear through what you have planned, it's not a big deal. Back off. Let them have fun. For the new dancer, there's no nothing worse than entering the class with the feeling that they won't be able to keep up and then having their worst fears come true. The job is to convince them by the end of their first session that they can not only do it, but they can do it well and really enjoy it. Remember, as a square dance teacher, real, your real objective is to sell the activity to the first non-dancer in the first session. That's your objective. I'm done. Okay, that's Daryl Clendon, and let's give him a nice hand. Mm -hmm. One of, the, one of the things you might notice there, Daryl didn't talk a lot about the nuts and the bolts and the mechanics of teaching that first night. He talked about attitude. He talked about attitude and our attitude toward not only teaching the class but toward the new people has an awful lot to do. Yeah, the first night's there. Uh, next we've got Jerry Story. Uh, first of all, you mentioned uh, our program in the Rio Grande Valley. Just to explain to you what we do down there, it might be something you could incorporate in your areas. I don't know. Uh, the six six callers, we got together, I don't know. Jerry Hague, you're here, aren't you? How many years ago? Twelve years ago? Sixteen years? I don't know. Time flies. Long time ago, anyway. And we got together, and we went to the Chamber of Commerce and as a group. Uh, held a lot more clout and uh, called ourselves an association and and got support from the Chamber of Commerce and they help us advertise our beginner classes and uh, we've had a lot of success with that and then we all provide a dance for the new students once a week so there's six places that they, people can go dance uh, basic level all year long in the Rio Grande Valley and it, it, it has worked out very very well uh, my topic is the second lesson. The second night of class is a very important one. More times than not, we will have brand new people who have missed the first lesson. This makes our job as instructors a little tricky. We must catch these folks up with the rest and at the same time allow those who attended the week before the opportunity to really dance these same calls. It's a good idea to review such things as smoothness and shuffling in the feet. Maybe put on a patter record with a good solid bass beat and let the class practice shuffling to the beat of the music. Teach the boys to stay close together while promenading around the square. This will keep the girls from having to run. Start right away by teaching good timing. Forward and back is the most used example of horrible timing. Many well-known callers, and I know a bunch of them, many of them will just not learn to give the dancers time to go forward and back. They say, up to the middle and back, square through. And it drives me crazy every time I hear a caller say forward and back and then not give the dancers time to do it. Now, while the first-timers are learning the calls, the second-timers are learning also. And they are all becoming smoother dancers. Granted, the second timers only know a few calls and at this point at this point, but chances are they are eagerly wanting to continue learning. So many times at this point right here we overload their circuits when there's really no need. We do not have to teach a lot of new calls. We may teach one or two calls, but we should be careful. Chances are whatever new calls we teach at that point would have to be repeated the next week anyway which would be the last opportunity for new people to get into the class so it's kind of like compounding to your problem if you do teach too many calls remember we need to blend this group into one so they can carry on with the rest of the lessons so how do we do this and keep those who attended the first class entertained the best way is to take what they know and expand on it 
We're not talking about extended applications or anything such as this. What we are saying is a little variety will go a long way to equalizing the floor in lieu of teaching more calls. Therefore, the original students, first-timers, will feel that they have also learned something new. Let's take a look at the calls that we may have taught the first night, and I just picked these at, at random. This is uh, pretty much what I teach the first night. Uh, square, identi square and dancer identification, accolade of partner and corner, forward and back, circle left and right, alamen left, promenade, do -si do swing, right and left grand, right hand star, left hand star, courtesy turn, and ladies chain. That would be a pretty good lesson, wouldn't it? Sound pretty good? All right. If I were to teach more calls the second lesson, I would prefer to teach grand uh, square or pass through. Most of the time I do not feel the need, however that would be my choice if time allowed and the dancers could handle it, depending on if you had new people there or not. Uh, remember that Caller Lab uh, teaching order is recommended, not mandatory. I would not suggest jumping too far ahead on the basic list and especially not the mainstream list. It becomes too easy to skip over certain calls and not give the new dancers the experience and the practice time on every call that they need to know. I hear of callers who try and justify starting from the bottom of the mainstream list and working up while another caller in the area begins at the top and works down. I hear horror stories about callers teaching mainstream calls far too early in beginner class. I've heard some teach mainstream calls the second and third night. These are things I hear. I mean, I can't believe it, but when dancers come to you and tell you and you hear it from other callers, you kind of start thinking it's true. I personally do not agree with this philosophy. In my judgment, this theory only compounds to our rush to the next level syndrome. Some callers try to corner the market so the dancers can only dance with them. This is warped logic, and callers that do this should rethink their strategy. They will never achieve longevity with their programs. All they can ever hope for is another class that they can rush through the system. All of us will have to learn to work and entertain with the basic calls if we plan to be successful for many years to come. The days of using our programs to tease dancers to the next level are coming to an end. Teaching the basics well and accommodating new dancers with 50 calls is our future. If anyone here remembers anything that I've said so far, please remember that the basic list is our future for prosperity. Each one of the basic calls can be expanded on even during the second lesson not only with variety, but showing the new dancers how to smooth out their dancing and really get into the music. It's very important for us as callers to create the ultimate dancing experience for these people. We need to call like we're calling for a hundred squares of dancers at a national convention and show these dancers the time of their life. To accomplish this, we all need a much larger repertoire made up of the basic calls. We need to give the same dedication for entertainment value to the basic program that we have given to honing our entertainment skills with the plus list over the years. This should begin with the first and the second night of class and continue on throughout the entire set of lessons. After teaching the calls, give the beginners a chance to dance it. The best way is to call the calls and then shut up. Let the dancers hear the music. Put the wind in their face and let them enjoy the dancing experience. Now let's go back to the variety that I was speaking about, using only the calls they know. Let's begin with circle left and circle right. And by the way, I do have handouts up here of all this stuff that's in here. If you just help yourself after the session's over. Circle left and circle right. Uh, not only can, you, uh, can all eight circle left and right, but four can circle left and right, such as heads or sides. We can also circle single file. Or we can circle in fractions, such as all eight circle a quarter or a half or three quarters. Or four dancers can circle a quarter or a half or three quarters. All this stuff is great tools uh, to use if you want to equalize the floor while you're going through this transition phase uh, with your first lesson, your second lesson, your third lesson's open. By the time the third lesson gets here, it's really compounded itself because you've got a Duke's mixture of so many different uh, levels. But these little things like that can help. Alamen left your corner can be expanded to alamen right your partner. Or we can introduce the term turn by the left, full turn, or turn by the right, full around. do -si do can be expanded from just do -si doing partner to run across the street, do -si do the opposite lady. There's nothing wrong with that. 
swing can also be used the same way. There's nothing wrong with swinging your corner and then going back home and swinging your partner. And if you want, run across the street and swing the opposite lady. Now come back home and swing your partner. All these things. And the dancers at the second lesson, you might not have even showed that the first night. But the second time through, all of them can do that, see? So you're equalizing the floor by tossing out little things like that that the first timers didn't get in on either. So they feel like they learned something. And the second timers that are just there for the very first time, they do it just as easy as the, as the other people. So you're equalizing the floor. Promenade can be expanded on. Single file promenade or teaching fractions of a promenade, such as heads promenade half, all the sides circle half. And you get everybody moving. One's going clockwise, one's going counterclockwise, and it gives them a whole new look. But it's things they can do once they're taught the, the, the calls. Right and left grand. It can be expanded on to wrong way grand. It could be uh, uh, right and left grand without hands. Weave the ring at that point. Uh, you could do a right and left grand, and on your third hand, promenade your partner home. That works best if you start with your ladies chained. If all four ladies were chained and you're circling alamen left, right and left grand on your third hand prominent home, that's a new look for the for the first timers. You know they've never seen that. You didn't show them that the week before, but you might show it to them the second week because it's something that everybody can can get involved with. It's just more stuff once they've learned it and you use that to dance them. Probably the good hour at least at the end of the dance. Uh, right and left hand stars can be expanded upon. Uh, using not only boy star and girl star, but head star and right and left and side star right and left. Uh, if you, such things as a head star left, uh, one full turn back by the right, star by the right, go the other way around to the corner alamen left. Courtesy turn can be expanded on by doing an alamen right your corner, back to your partner, courtesy turn. Or simply called do paso directional form. It's a good tool. Great tool early in the game. Ladies chain can be expanded upon by using fractions such as ladies chain three quarters or head ladies only. Chain across or to the left or the right. Boy, that'll throw them for a loop. That's hard. We just don't call it. But you know, we called that when I first started calling. That was a biggie. Head ladies chain to the right, chain to the left. But you can practice. You can do that. You can show them that, the, the, that they already know it. If you just direct them as what to go, you've got another little tool and you really haven't taught any more calls. Uh, you, you, you won't need all this stuff in one dance, you know, or one class. I mean, just little bits of it. You can pick out just different things, and it doesn't take much to equalize your floor and to keep everything in balance and everybody dancing and everybody learning and everybody having fun. Remember, the most important thing is to teach smoothness and rhythm and give the new dancers a wonderful square dance experience. Work on changing the figures for singing calls that give the new dancers plenty of time to execute the calls while still giving them a sense of wind in the face dancing. Do a good job teaching, but don't forget to take time to entertain the new dancers. We need to put the dance back in square dancing. Modern society is more demanding for a high quality of entertainment than they have ever been in the past. Modern Western square dancing is a quality product and we must present it in the same way. These things will help create a great atmosphere. Use good timing. Be enthusiastic. Use music the new dancers can relate to. And try to sing on key. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Jerry's, Jerry's story. Yeah, try to sing on key. Notice again, uh, uh, both Daryl and Jerry have not talked about teaching a great deal of material in those first lessons. They're trying to sell these people on the dance experience, on on dancing to music, to to rhythm, to get a feel for what the activity is about, and to get to know the people that are there with them. They're all on the same level. So we've, we've talked about this first night of lessons. We've talked about the second night of lessons. And now we're to that final night, that third night of lessons, where this is where we decide whether these people are going to stay with us and continue lessons or whether we lose them. And remember that if you lose them, chances are you might have lost their friends, too, uh, that maybe would come in in another year. So Lanny's going to address 
uh, this final, this third night of lessons, Lanny Wicklin. Thank you. Some of the things I have to say might be a repeat on some of the things that Daryl and Jerry said, but I think they're worth saying again. Uh, hooking the dancer is convincing the dancer by the end of the third lesson. Square dancing is something they want to do. It takes a lot more than just teaching the calls. The hook is the dancer must be having fun. Anyone who quits doing something they enjoy, which is fun for them, quits for one of only few possible reasons. Three of them come to mind. They don't have time, their health prevents it, or they can't afford it. Since we can do nothing about the first two, as affordability, square dancing has long been one of the cheapest forms of entertainment around. We all know that. I submit to you that if a new dancer attends three sets of lessons and then does not complete the full sets of lessons, they are quitting because they don't have time, their health prevents it, or they're not having fun. What is this element that makes the activity fun? I believe there are entertainment, sociability, and in case of dancing, action or movement. Our job is, as, as callers is to provide all three elements in a proportion that, feeds, that pleases our audience. Let's see what can be done. Socialization. Square dancing is a social activity. People choose to come to a square dance class expecting to be involved with other people. We must promote and encourage that from the beginning. Someone, that should, someone should be at or outside the door to welcome the new dancers in, help hang up coats, just as we do as a club dance. The caller, partner, and club host should personally greet each new dancers in the hall beginning with at each session. Greet them with a welcome smile and a warm handshake. It's a little too early for a yellow rock. That might scare some people away. Save that for a few weeks when you know everyone better. Learn names as quickly as possible. Have new dancers wear name tags. Paper tags work. We switch to semi-permanent tags and recycle them at the end of each lesson, at the beginning of each new lesson. The second, by the second and third night, the caller, partner, and club host should also be introducing new dancers to club angels who are most compatible by age, interest, hometown, whatever. Our job is to encourage the social interactivity of the new dancer with the experienced dancers. The goal is to develop new friendships, bonds that will continue after the lessons are over. If necessary, select a compatible angel. Ask them to spend extra time with the new dancer on breaks to help them get involved. At this time, I'd like to pause and like to say that how important I think that the caller's partner is a great asset to lessons. A partner who supports the activity and participates in lessons is a great asset to the caller and to the activity. The partner can be an extra set of eyes for the caller. He or she can be watching for handholds, grips, or styling problems that might appear early. By letting the caller make corrections early, be easier to break a bad habit that they might have learned. Uh, the partner can spot a weakness of a particular dancer. Set up an angel square to help that dancer get through some of the more difficult calls. Uh, all this can be done quietly and planned during breaks. A partner and a caller develop high and eye and hand signals that work even during lesson tips. The caller, club host, angel should mix and visit with the new dancers at every break. The angel should have a goal to meet and greet it, to know every one of the new dancers. Sometimes the caller and partner need to encourage this a little, pointing to an angel who might be standing out to the side. Uh, this brings to mind a, 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 special, a particular gentleman we had in lessons, our first set of lessons we started teaching in 1996 in this 1010 program, who always stood over by himself. He never enjoyed. We thought after the third lesson, he wouldn't be back. The fourth lesson, he came back. And we noticed he was just standing just outside the ring of conversation. Then by about the fifth or sixth week, he was in the conversation and being a little one-on-one. -on -one. By the end of the lessons, when he had finally finished his first ten weeks of lessons, to our surprise, he came up and grabbed the microphone and told everyone a joke. He was having fun. He just didn't show it on the outside. So you have to be very careful about, you know, try to get people involved. When a caller is mixing with the new dancers at break, 
he is always also giving them an opportunity to know him as a friend. He is able to give individual encouragement and maybe even a little one-on-one -on -one training. These can both be essential in keeping the new dancer in class. This relationship should be established by the third night. It is, is critical that the, the new dancers like the caller. You may be the worst singer, the worst choreographer, the worst teacher around, but the dancers will still come back if they like you personally. On the other hand, the best caller in the world will not keep dancers in class if they think he's a jerk. True. <laughs> Through the entire set of lessons, keep in mind the importance of the social experience and the retention of dancers. Facilitate it whenever possible. Entertainment, the caller is the primary source of inter entertainment in class. There may be some good stories shared during the breaks, but the caller is entertaining while teaching. How do you do this? First, you set the dancers at ease by making the learning experience as effortless as possible. Each night, you repeat, repeat, repeat all the calls taught in earlier sessions. It helps to spend a lot of the first tip reviewing and repeating. This also helps you see what movements and definitions were remembered and which ones would need more work. Second, have fun with the dancers. Interact as you teach. If you can, have a dancer come up and help you model on the new calls. Pick someone who is already confident. Have them demonstrate the call as you coach them. When you're finished, praise them and have the group applaud them. Whenever you can, compliment over the microphone. Be careful not to embarrass anyone. But there are many times when a smile out loud with someone who has made a mistake and recovered is fantastic, and they know that. It's, a, it's like saying that to the dancers, it's okay to make a mistake, maybe even expected, but you recovered well. I always tell my dancers if they make a mistake, they should never admit it. Turn around and smile at the person behind you. They think they did it. We use a smile around, turn around rule a lot in lessons. Third source of entertainment is your choice of pattern music or singing calls. The music should have a good beat. The beat needs to be steady and come through the music consistently. Music should be energetic and lighthearted, not overbearing. Avoid records with a lot of counter, counter melody. This can confuse the newer dancers and distract them from the first beat of the measure. Ideal music will echo and enhance the beat, helping dancers feel the shuffle from the very beginning. Remember the pre preconceived notion that square dancers only dance to old-fashioned music. This can keep people from continuing with lessons. Don't assume the new dancers are not concerned about that. Instead, don't lean too heavily on either blue glass bluegrass or rock sounds. Look for a variety of music. Stay away from heavy banjos and fiddles. My favorite hoedowns for lessons is one called Company Coming on Dance Ranch. Great record. Used it many times at the end of a difficult teach. Everything seems to flow smoothly. The third element that I believe is, uh, is fun square dancing is action or movement. People came to lessons expecting to do something physical. If they'd wanted to sit they would have chosen a theater or a bridge club. Give them movement as soon as possible. Use singing calls at every lesson. I do a singing call on the very first night of every and every night of lessons. I try to do one at the end of every tip as we do in a regular dance. It doesn't always work, but it's a goal I set. I think singing calls are a strong source of entertainment. I try to use a variety of records, one that features a variety of music, styles we all use, 50s, countries, pop, etc. But records have to have an easy to hear beat and a minimum of counter melody on the first nights of lessons. The new dancers are only beginning to learn how to listen. They don't need the distraction from the music. For the same reason I pick singing calls that dancers will like and will relax them and set them at ease. Pick singing calls they may already know. Avoid real wordy songs because you won't have to do have time to do most of the words anyway. Be successful. That's what's important. Be successful. Uh, my singing call figures always, always uh, go with the calls we have just learned. Try to put those in a singing call. Make sure they get through them. Uh, never let the dancer stand too long. I think there's nothing worse than standing minutes while the caller lectures on and on. Adults learn by doing and by repetition. 
Use that to your advantage. Teach a new call, then use it frequently. When you teach the next call, put them together and repeat them several times. Use them in a singing call. I try to play my, my singing calls at normal speed, at which is 45 or just a little lower, and I allow extra, and I use fewer calls. It gives the beat, uh, the dancer, the extra beats of music to pick up the time if their their reaction time is slower. Uh, I save calls like that seem fast, like Neutron Dance, Fisherman's Luck, and Mountain Pass for later in lessons and graduation. We have three elements that make dancing fun: socialization, entertainment, action, and movement. The third lesson, the, we have a unique situation for the third lesson. We have those that have come back for all three sessions. At that time, they're hooked. Our job will be to retain them. They want new calls. They want to see progress. We need to continue to entertain them and continue socialization with, socialization with the group. Those who started on the second lesson may still be unsure. On the third night of lessons, we have to hook them and hopefully retain them for the next week. Entertainment and socialization, again, is one of the key factors. Those that are coming in for the first time to the third lesson will automatically feel, be behind, feel behind, dumber than the rest, socially unconnected. Our job is to make them feel welcome, offer them the best introductory entertainment experience that we can. We accelerate their socialization, socialization with the rest of the group. The third session is often the most difficult because we need to meet the, the needs of three groups. We need to find a balance between teaching enough new calls so that the dancers are dancing feel forward progress, but not teaching so much that they are overwhelmed. If you do have new dancers on the third session, your goal should be to successfully teach these people the call from the first two sessions by the end of the third session. This will likely be a little bit more than they would normally be comfortable with. You'll need to foster a team attitude towards that goal. Don't be afraid to say, we have some new dancers joining us for the first time tonight. I want to try to get them through all the calls we have used so far. So you folks, you'll be doing more calls than you normally would on the first night. Just hang in there. You'll do fine. The rest of you, this will be a great review. You'll feel like a pro tonight. This statement gives them confidence that they're going to be helping the newer dancers. Of course, if you have no new dancers on the third night, you're able to continue with the new material after reviewing what's been done so far. Uh, I have a different situation than Daryl and Jerry. I have angels because I'm a club caller. Uh, I have angels that I work with in my clubs. They're a very important role in my area. Uh, the dancers, they make socialization, contact with the new dancers back and forth. A new, new dancer who doesn't connect is less likely to dance after graduation. So you have to connect. Uh, angels must support the caller's teaching techniques. By uh, They should bring their concerns to the caller, not try to teach on the floor while the caller is calling. calling. Many times angels want to fix everything at once. This isn't possible. If the caller decides, to, it's up to the caller to decide what is the greatest teaching priority at any given time. Okay. Putting new dancers in the place, uh, moving them around is for an angel is uh, wants to put them there immediately and they, instead of letting the dancers make a mistake, that's bad. Let the dancers make this mistake and then they'll correct it themselves. Angel tips, angels that come to dances and want to say, we want to do an angel tip to show these people what we can do. The worst thing you can do is get up there on the third, second or third night of lessons and get two squares of hot shot dancers out there and call as fast as you can and have the new people on the side raise their eyebrows and say, gosh, I'll never be able to do that. You're going to demoralize them. Uh, in conclusion, I believe the way to hook dancers is to show them the fun of square dancing. That includes socialization, entertainment, and the movement of dance. When dancers experience three, these three elements, they'll want to come back. For years, when asked how long lessons are, I've replied, three weeks. After three weeks, you're either going to love it so much I couldn't drive you away, or you're going to decide square dancing is not for you, and I couldn't make you stay. A last parting thought. We must be able to hook the new dancers in three weeks or less, but the fun must continue every lesson. You can't let it up on socialization, entertainment, moving, and still expect to retain dancers. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Now, you just listened to three guys talk about the first three nights of lessons. Uh, they said a lot of the same things. And we did not talk a great deal about the mechanical process that's involved. Mechanically, you have to know the calls, how to present the calls, how to teach the calls. Uh, to quote Franklin, how to explain to a non-dancer how to execute a call in their words, in their, ver in their vernacular. And that's something that's also part of being a teacher. Uh, but these three first nights of lessons, they are what hook the people on the activity. And uh, mechanically, you have to be very sound in what you do. You have to have a lesson plan and be able to adjust that plan as it goes along. But the socialization is a huge factor. Um, I was spent the whole winter teaching in, in Arizona and asking people why they came to class. And uh, most of them came to class because their wives said they had to. <coughs> then I write. Yeah, they drag a rut with two feet coming right in the door and didn't want to be here, but they promised they would come for first time. Now, uh, Daryl will tell you, we had one of the most successful classes this year we've ever had. And we worked very hard at the socialization angle on it. And I asked them uh, just uh, Tuesday when they went out the door, I said, All right, are you enjoying the activity? Absolutely. And I said, what do you enjoy about it? Well, look at all our friends. Had nothing to do with the mechanical process. Look at all our friends. I had uh, one lady from Canada said they came to Arizona this year to sell her their trailer. They were going to go back to Canada. They'd been down two years. She said, we hadn't made a lot of friends. And she said, we had decided that we would come down because the money exchange is just awful. And we were going to sell our trailer. And we stayed a couple weeks, we started this class. She said, we've made so many friends, we just put an Arizona room on the trailer. <laughs> Had nothing to do with the activity, mechanically. Had to do with that circle of friends. And I started ending my classes many times by having everybody get in a big circle and they all say thank you. And before they do that, I said, take a look at what Square Dance has, has done for you. Take a look at your circle of friends. That's what it's about. And I don't know if, uh, I'm sure some of you have questions about the mechanical uh, part of it as well. But this socialization angle is much larger than we give a credit to and the fun that they get from the activity is a much bigger part than maybe we have given credence to in the past. Okay, again, if we have questions, uh, Lanny, would you want to run that microphone around? Or do you guys, uh, first of all, let's give our panel a nice hand. And uh, I'll give each one of these guys a, sh a chance to address some other things. Yeah, I have one other thing I wanted to say. Uh, Rooster gets up Easter morning, sees all those colored eggs goes out and beats the heck out of a peacock. <laughs> Can I say that over the microphone? Yeah. Okay. It might be bleak, but... <laughs> hey, just writing it down for Flippo. <laughs> you cleaned it up pretty good. Yeah, right? you did, actually. Uh, do you have questions for the panel? Uh, over there on the right. And please, again, put the questions on the microphone so that the tape is not blank. Uh, I'm Dale Dunn from Fort Smith, Arkansas. One of the many problems that I have and have had for several years, continues through the whole lesson, but is definitely in the first two or three sessions, when you have dancers coming back after 10 or 12 years out that know a little bit, remember a little bit what do you suggest to slow them down so they don't run off or intimidate the new first-time dancers what, what, what we do in our area we call those people retreads those people are coming back they want to 
get caught up and we get back into the activity again. I, we run a, a 10 week session. Every three months we start a new set of class. So when we have people that come to us after 10, 15, I got a call this week from somebody who's been out for 20 years, wants to come back to lessons again and try it. We put them in what we call our second set of lessons, which would be a mainstream set, and make them take 10 weeks of lessons right along with the new beginners that are just moved into the mainstream, 10 weeks of lessons. And that seems to hold them back, and they, they bond with that group, and that's the, dance, the core group that they dance with in our area. We are basically a mainstream area in the Midwest. Did that answer your question? Kind of? I smile a lot. That's good. Uh, well, uh, by let, that, let, by let that me... I mean I, I avoid frustration with them because that's that's the real danger there. If you get somebody out there that knows just enough to be pushing, pulling, uh, and not be patient with the other people in their square, I think that's what you're driving at, isn't it? They're in a hurry to get through, right. and they, okay. they know just enough to be dangerous. Uh, the big danger is on your end of it, getting frustrated with those people. I smile a lot. Just make it fun. It, it, don't let anything become important or more important than just the fun and games that are going on out there ever. Okay, let me expand just a little bit. If, if you've got not necessarily returning dancers, but if you've got two completely separate levels, you've got half of your dancers that is taking material and are comfortable with it, and half that are struggling, what do you use to equalize it so you don't bore one group or run off and leave the other group? Computer cards. We had a we had a very unique this year uh, in the in the valley. It was some years, you know, the whole class is just great, and man, they're zipping right through it. And then the next year, you got two couples that can't do nothing, and. We'll, and we had that this year, didn't we, Jerry? There's two or three of them. And, you know, it was really funny. We, we, we were pulling our hair out every week we'd meet, and, and we knew their names. We know the people, and we talked about it, and we said, hey, we're sending so-and-so to you. We told them, if you plan on doing this, you're really having trouble. you got to go take more lessons. We sent them to lessons every day. <laughs> we had them going to lessons, but they finally... They finally learned, and we had to spend an awful lot of time, just personal time, between tips. I mean, I was physically out on the floor showing this guy the beat, and he finally could dance on the beat, but then he, he, he moved his shoulders like a gorilla, you know, when he walked. And, but at the end of the, the ten lessons that we gave, we had him dancing. So, I, you know, you just don't ever want to give up on him. You just have to give him more help, I guess, but it can be done. Other questions uh, in the back? Ron Black from Los Angeles. For those of you who can't afford computer cards, take out the face cards of a deck of cards and use those to square up your sets. Just shuffle them, shuffle them, shuffle them, and then pass them out. That'll solve your computer problems. Very good point. Right here, Bob. I'm Bob Tucker from Wichita. And uh, a little comment on what Jerry said about what do you teach that second lesson. And he was talking about some very good things of expanding some of the things you did the first lesson. I use another approach. I don't teach the, the same things the second lesson. I'll use some other calls in there that are substitutes so I don't rush them through and try to try to keep them entertained and and um, but I don't want to I don't want to push them to where they are they're learning too much and so I use different calls and then the third lesson I'll come back up and maybe pick up the calls that I didn't teach the second lesson and then by the fourth lesson I've got them in there. There's plenty of time to do those first few calls. I mean, they're, they're calls they're going to use the rest of their life. And so that's how I manage that situation. I just don't teach the same calls. 
people that took the first class, they probably don't remember what they learned anyway, so they don't, they're not going to miss it. And that's how I accomplished that. A question from the other side of the hall here on use of playing cards. There are four suits in a deck, meaning one couple, two couple, three couple, four couple. There are numerically one through ten. So you have the use of at least ten squares in any one deck of cards to mix up your crowd. One of the things that uh, I heard Bob talk about, this gentleman on the right talk about, was about frustration. Uh, two kinds of frustration that you deal with in a new class. First of all, uh, you want to avoid dancer frustration at all costs because that's what drives them out of the activity. But also you have to avoid caller frustration. It's sometimes easily easy to become frustrated with new people. Take your time and enjoy those new people because they're going to be your new friends and uh, take your time with them avoid frustration and again when you you start a class you have to have a lesson plan you have to have a method that you're going to teach uh, I know Daryl and I both get down on the floor and teach a great many of our calls on the floor ourselves where people can see that people learn in, in different ways. Some can learn by hearing, some learn by seeing, uh, some just takes constant repetition. But there are different ways people learn and you have to learn all of those ways because you have to satisfy all of those people. Uh, kind of like Jerry and, and Jerry Haig were talking about here. You have some couples that it just takes them a ton of repetition and a ton of learning by doing uh, where somebody else may be told them how to do it and away they go uh, we've all been faced with that and it all comes down to frustration but you can avoid a great deal of that with your attitude toward teaching other questions have you ever had a student who just could not do it you know, after 10 lessons, you do circle left, element left, and they don't know who to do the element yeah. left with. What is your name, sir? Where are you from? Tom Hogan from Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Tom Hogan. Okay, I only one time in all the years that I had that, uh, and it was in Mesa here a few years ago, I had a lady that could not learn. Uh, it is probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. After the second lesson, uh, I took her outside, and I, I just was very frank with her. And I, I said, this is something that's going to be very frustrating for you. And she said, well, these other people probably have danced before. And I said, no, they haven't. I said, they're just like you. But I said, uh, I don't like to play bridge because I'm not good at it. I said, there are some sometimes we have things that we're maybe not as good at. I said, you can learn to square dance, but it's going to be a very frustrating and tiresome thing for you to do. And perhaps you want to think about it. I said, I'm not going to tell you you can't come back, but I'm going to tell you that it's going to be a very frustrating thing for you. And rather to do that, would it be better that you find something else that you would enjoy doing? Because I said, you're not enjoying this, are you? And she said, no, I'm embarrassed. And I said, it has nothing to do with you. Uh, square dancing isn't for everybody. And uh, I love you dearly. You can come back and visit us any time. But I said, it's something you might want to think, uh, think about that's going to be very frustrating and not going to be a lot of fun for you. And uh, she thanked me for that. She still comes through the hall every Tuesday afternoon. I see her every Tuesday. Uh, the other side of the coin on that, I'm, and I, I agree with what you're saying. Sometimes it's just you have to do that. But uh, the nice thing about ten lessons and ten lessons and ten lessons, if you if you're using the ten 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 to cultivate dancers, it works great because. At 10 weeks, you, all you got to do is go up to them and say, you know what, 
You need to go back through lessons. I love you. I want to help you. But you need to go back through. Um, I've never had the heart to ask anybody to leave. I just put up with them. You know, and I ask the people to put up with them. And then sometimes the people rebel. I've had three squares, four squares walk up to me and say, you either ask that couple to leave or we're leaving. What do you think of that? And I, and I look at them and I say, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you next week. So they're all, I make them think about it for a whole week. They're wondering what in the heck I'm going to come back with and tell them. So I got them psychologically right there. They're on the defensive. They walk in the next week looking like a bunch of sheeps, and I get up there on the stage and I tell them, you know, I thought about it, and I tell the whole floor what these four squares asked me to do, and I tell them, I thought about it, and I've come to the conclusion, I can't do it, because if I do, that's going to make it somebody else the weakest dancer on the floor, and then you're going to want me to ask them to leave, and then that's going to make somebody else the weakest dancer on the floor, and then you're going to want me to ask them to leave, and pretty soon it's going to be you, and then by that time they're saying, Uncle... We'll stay, we'll stay. <laughs> Wish I'd have thought about that. I sent them to the tip of Texas. <laughs> Next. Herb Egan, <clears throat> Green Valley, Arizona. I don't have a question. Uh, I just finished a project for Caller Lab of reviewing 39 tapes that cover 15 years of seminars on teaching. I swore I never wanted to hear the word again, teaching. But here I am, and I'm glad I came. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you. A couple of other comments. I heard the comment uh, saying in retaining people and so forth, of telling them that uh, square dancing is cheaper than many other forms of recreation. I would encourage us all, since we're uh, worried about media, to change that to say square dancing is relatively inexpensive in comparison to other forms of recreation. And let's not put the term cheaper on our wonderful activity. It's not a cheap activity. It's a relatively inexpensive activity. Um, and I, again, I don't want to be critical and I don't want to pick on anybody, especially somebody as big as Jerry's story. <laughs> but uh, this morning I heard uh, what uh, seemed to me a, an official switch in Collar Lab uh, direction to pay more attention to heritage and that sort of things and perhaps less attention to some of the technical stuff. Uh, do -si do I don't know of anybody in the country that teaches do -si do There might be a few, but do -si do is four hands up and here you go around and around a do -si do The lady goes see, the gent goes do, chicken in a bread tray picking up door and one more change and on you go. And that's the northern do -si do which came out of an, uh, an argument between Pappy Shaw and Herb Gregerson. Pappy Shaw won, and that became the North e Northern do -si do and Herb Gregerson lost, and that became do Paso. What we do with a back-to-back -back, uh, movement comes from the French term, which means back-to-back, -back, and that's called a do -sa do And little things like that I think we ought to pay attention to in preserving our history and heritage. And again, I do not mean to be critical in any way because you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Dick Parrish, Hobbs, New Mexico. You touched on a subject just a moment ago about really getting frustrated with a student. And I had the same problem happen to me while I was teaching for the junior college. I could tell the gentleman exactly what to do, and he couldn't do it. And you know what the problem was? It, everybody overlooks it. He was left-handed. You've got to learn to know whether people are right or left-handed because that's the side of the body that they think with, and that's what, the, what they move first. 
And uh, after we got that straightened out, I had no more problems with them at all. And then Jerry brought up the, the problem about the couples wanting to have some other people just quit square dancing and, and leave. There was one of the fellows that I taught <clears throat> that it took him four sets of lessons, he and his wife, to learn how to square dance, and it's probably one of the best bunch that we ever had. As far as a couple, it was always 100% for the club. He came to me, and he told me straight out, he said, if you don't have that couple leave, my wife and I are going to quit. And I told him, John, I said, I can't do that. I said, because if I'd done that, I would have had to told you to leave three years ago. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Uh, and as I said earlier, that's the only person I've ever had to do that in my life. And she could not learn. And it's, it was that simple. Uh, she could not learn corner, partner, alimony left. She could not learn, period. Uh, it's the only time I've ever been faced with it. Jury story. Yeah, I just thought I'd pass along something we have done with some success. It's not exactly what you've been talking about, but sometimes somebody misses several lessons. And they call you on the phone and say, gee, I've missed four lessons. Uh, you know, what's my chances? Well, probably not very good. So what we've been doing, we send them a certificate. Let's suppose they've taken five, six, seven lessons. We send them a certificate saying, come back next year. The first seven lessons are free. And that way, it just kind of makes it nice, and they very often do show up. And it's a nice way of saying, you know, don't come now. Come talk to us later. That's a good idea. Hi, I'm Gary Potras from Moscow, Idaho. Um, one other thing in the first three lessons is to make sure that if you see somebody who is not getting in, find out if they're a little bit hard of hearing, and you may want to ask them to move a little bit towards the front or towards the speaker, or our club ends up having free hearing enhancements for people. They're a little bit on the shy side to do that, but sometimes during the course of the lessons, it's good to let them try it once and for them to find out. I wear one when I'm in a big hall, um, just for the fact that I have a little bit of clarity that I need to adjust for. But uh, it's one aspect, even the first three lessons, is pay attention to people in terms of whether they're hearing it may have a, cause them a problem as much as anything else. It's on? Okay. My name is Francois Lamoureau from Munich in Germany. Um, I want to come back to what the guy with the third night said. I think that's what uh, most uh, people in Europe work with, clubs, not collar run uh, uh, programs. So uh, angels are very important. And I make sure that before we start open houses and before we start first class nights, I'm going to tell my angels really what I expect them to do because they, they can help so much, but they can also cause a lot of damage. For instance, things like there's only one teacher on the floor and that's me, nobody else in these things. And I, th I just wanted to put some more emphasis on uh, letting your angels know beforehand what they have to do in order to contribu uh, contribute to a successful class program? You know, nothing is tougher. Think about this. Put yourself back in the place where you were just in lessons and the people helping you. There is nothing tougher for an angel to come and dance that slow. Who makes the most mistakes on the first or second night? The angels. But the, the first or second or third night, you want to be successful with your listeners and your angels. Uh, I set up my squares. I, don't, I do a little Sicilian circle like Daryl has begin with, but then I move my couples into squares. I always have the, head, the, the angel couples opposite each other and the, the listener couples opposite each other. That way, when you have them working the figures, there was that experienced corner right off the bat. So your success rate goes up tremendously. Anybody else? 
Boy, Cindy, they're running you all over the hall, aren't they? Wayne Weston from San Antonio, Texas. One of the things that I do to, to mix up the couples a little bit, if I have a lot of angels, is I put all experienced boys in one square and all experienced girls in another. I have the boys with inexperienced girls, the girls with inexperienced boys. Because if you have the experienced couples at the head position, the inexperienced at the side, when you swing your corner twice, then you, both of you are inexperienced. You have your, your inexperienced couples are back together, basically. But if you put all the same sex experience in each square, then you eliminate that problem. And it works very well. Okay, any others? Yes, one more. Uh, Bill Packard, Oklahoma City. I have a senior citizen club, double nickel, it's over 55. And I have one of the ladies getting Alzheimer's. And, uh, I, uh, I get frustrated myself, you know, but I don't show it. I try not to. But it is kind of, you know, but the dancers do real good with it. They understand that she needs help. So, uh, it works out, but it's kind of frustrating sometimes for them and us. Me too. Some years ago when I was doing a seminar on teaching, I was talking about teaching square dancing. Somebody in the audience smarter than I am said, we're not teaching square dancing, we're teaching people to square dance. And I'm very pleased to hear you three gentlemen emphasize the point that we're teaching people to square dance. That's exactly right. We are in the people business. This is a people business. And we're selling an entertainment uh, product. Uh, this is not a spectator sport. Part of a part of our competition at this stage of the game and in, in our activity is there's so many spectator sports around. A lot of cities have four professional sports teams. They've got college teams, and we are very much as a society into spectator sports, where our recreation is a uh, uh, participant. We, we participate in the recreation. That's uncommon for a lot of people looking for recreation. So we have a little different sell, and we have to sell that social part of it. Uh, Jerry, you had something you wanted it. No? No? Okay. Any other questions? Anybody? Right? Oh, Dana? Really, any questions? The question is for any one of you on the panel. Do you involve line dancing or mixers or anything the first night? First three nights? Uh, I, I like to put on some country western music. Maybe get them two stepping, or I don't really do line dances so much. Maybe later on I might show them an old, like the Hully Gully or something silly like that, or the Birdie Dance or something. But uh, I like to just let them dance. I put on some two, country two steps. If they don't know how to two step, you know, I'll just teach, show them real quick, and it's, it's a lot of fun for them. And uh, it's, it's just a waltz, you know. They love to just get up and waltz between. I I don't because I I prefer my people to socialize during that time to get to meet the angels for me to get to meet them if if I put a line dance or something on in between every tip I don't get a chance to talk to the people in lessons and I want to talk to everybody one on one to get to know a little about them and let them know a little about me so I don't I don't do line dances or mixers but uh, the particular way that I've been doing my lessons does mix the dancers as couples in that Sicilian circle. They get around the floor, they get to dance with a lot of different folks. Uh, and it's a very, very nice, easy way to present square dancing to them. Okay, others? Elmer? One way it has to work. I'm Elmer Claycomb from Prescott Valley, Arizona. The first night out, second night, sometimes the third night, every person on the floor is keeping time. Somewhere along the line, they forget how to keep time, and they start 
thinking or something so hard that they forget how to keep time. Ideas how to keep them moving their feet, which I think makes the dancing so much easier because when they're still moving their feet, you know how many steps they're going to take to do things and pretty soon they're down, slowing down. I, I usually find out it's about the time you introduce square through that they seem to forget how to move their feet. What? <laughs> what? Uh, I don't know. I teach square through the first night. Sorry, but I do. Uh, in the Sicilian circle, it works out very, very nicely. Uh, I don't teach square through as such, but I do teach square through three and square through five on the first night. Uh, and that's right in with the shuffling of the feet and keeping time with the music. I uh, probably the best answer I could give to that is if you are, if your delivery, the delivery of your patter is in within a rhythm and being delivered with the rhythm of the music, chances are they'll uh, pretty much keep the rhythm as well. Uh, first timers and new dancers, you have to give them extra beats frequently and it's not going to be perfect, but uh, I wish I knew your problem better than that. I'm sorry, Elmer, I really don't. Cherry does though. <laughs> What was the problem? <laughs> okay, yes, sir. Uh, my name's Clay Goss. I'm from Newark, Delaware. Uh, I've heard the Sicilian Circle mentioned by a number of you here a number of times, and I've never felt I had enough folks on the floor to do it. How many do you feel is a minimum? Four couples. Uh, if you think of it, then, do you all understand what we're talking about when we say Sicilian circle? It's a circle of two couples facing each other. Uh, if you were having the whole floor of dancers promenading as couples in one large circle and you had every other couple wheel around to face the couple behind them, you would have a Sicilian circle. Every time. <laughs> one, one, once a week for the last 12 weeks. As a matter of fact, you ought to see the plus dancers do that one. Uh, yes, I've called that as a matter of fact. They seem to adjust to it for some reason. But usually what I say is beginning with this couple, every other couple wheel around and bing, 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 right around the hall. Uh, but four couples, if you can think of uh, uh, four couples together and uh, you have them now... Uh, well, I should go through some of this. Could I have four couples, please? please uh, the question was asked. I wouldn't do it otherwise. Four couples. Uh, like most callers, with the four couples, I would start. I'm not. Don't expect you to go through all of this, but I would start like a lot of callers would with the just the circle. Don't do a circle left, but I would teach circle left, circle right, Alaman left. Right and left grand, uh, do si do, promenade, all those kind of things with the four couples. Uh, then I might teach something, well, if I only had the four couples, on, I'm talking first night, I would teach them their square identification so they know heads and sides. I would teach head couples, if you would please, uh, lead to the right, and I would teach them, and I walk them through this, and uh, eh, maybe circle four, three quarters or a half and then a quarter more and I would teach them this and that show them that they have lines of four now this is the same as a Sicilian circle as far as the kind of material that you can use because it's two couple material the only difference is when they pass through which you would use in a Sicilian circle do that and they move on to the next it's the same as a bend the line isn't it no difference so using uh, the same types of movements that you would use in the Sicilian circle, you can take them pass through, move on to the next, back out, make a big ring and circle left, da 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 you know, and back to the Alaman left, right and left grands, etc. But that's how you would use four couples, Sicilian circle type material with four couples rather than the six. Anything less than six couples, 
Uh, I saw oh, saw one other couple. It was Randy jump up there. Uh, Randy, would you mind coming back up with your partner and make it five couples? Pardon? Yeah, well, whatever. But uh, circle left. Okay, Alaman left the corner. Promenade your partner. Don't slop. Don't don't stop. I mean, Ran, beginning with Randy. Every other couple wheel around. Well, I don't know. Oh, got one out. Pass through. Move on to the next. There's a different one out. So whatever you're working, even with the five couples, uh, if you have five couples, nobody has to sit out. You can work your circle four halfway if you want to, please. Circle up four halfway. Pass through, move on to the next couple. And there's a different couple out. That's one of the advantages of being able to work the material in this fashion. Nobody sits out. You can have your experienced dancers, your angels out on the floor at the same time. A different couple is getting to dance with a, an angel couple as you go along. If you have two couples that are having trouble, pass them through and on to the next till they get to the angel couple, right? Uh, but, okay, that's fine, gang. That's fine. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes. Microphone. My question is, when you do the Sicilian circles, do you very often get them circle left to quarter so that they're working this way instead of moving on around? Not the first night. But yes, I do. Uh, like I say, the, the, the question was, uh, in the Sicilian circle, where we have the two couples facing, if they circle only a quarter, uh, the inside couples will be facing the outside walls while the outside couples facing the inside of the circle. Uh, do I call it that way very often? Yes. Not typically on the first night, uh, but you could. There's no reason why you couldn't. Like I say, typically I'll do square through three and square through five. The reason I do those kind of movements is because they're continually moving on to the next couple. A square, uh, if you had them circle up four, okay, circle four halfway, if you would please, face that two, square through three, count one, two, three, pull straight by, move on to the next couple. Square through five hands, one, two, three, four, five, move on to the next couple. Circle four, three quarters. Now they're going to be facing those outside walls. Square through four. Go one, two, three, four. Move on to the next couple. But they've changed partners. Uh, you may want to wait until after a two ladies chain if you want to keep those people's paired up. Yes. A question right here first. Um, do, what about singing calls when you're... You work I, them this way. I work How do you them, put I, personally, I take them into the squares to do the singing call. I do get okay. them in squares the first night. Uh, but practically everything that I teach the first night, with the exception of right and left grand and everything, I do in this because I can get them through the square throughs. I can get them through circle fours. You know, I can do a pass throughs and courtesy turns, uh, uh, two ladies chain. And they're working two couple sets, which are less confusing than having all four couples out there. Uh, and just the, the amount of material that you can get them to accomplish and do well and feel comfortable with it. And one night works out so well this way. Yes. Mel Estes, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. What do you do? I've heard nobody address this. It's a, it's a known fact that women outlive men. What do you do on a first night if you have... 15 people there, 12 of them are single women and three men. How do you handle that? How do I handle it? Uh, I don't. I don't guarantee partners for women. Do you fellows have, uh, if they want to dance as partners, I don't discourage it. But uh, I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. All right, we're up up to our time, three o'clock, right? And again, Daryl talked a little bit about the mechanics here, and Jerry talked about things he would teach, but there's more to teaching lessons than the mechanics of the calls. There's more to being a caller than just doing the job 
of teaching the mechanical process of lessons. You have to hook these people on the activity, hook them on the entertainment factor and on the fun and the friendship that they get. And I'd like to have you give Lanny Weekland, Jerry Story, and Daryl Clendenin a big hand. And a sincere thank you to all of you for attending.